Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And thank you for coming to this uh, webinar on anti-trafficking education. My name is Borisov Gerasimov, uh, and I'm uh, the program coordinator for communications and advocacy uh, at the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women. GATWO is an international feminist NGO network with, uh, made up of around 100 NGOs in different parts of the world um, who advocate for the rights of uh, migrant and trafficked women. Uh, one of our activities is to publish the Anti-Trafficking Review, which is the first open access peer-reviewed journal that focuses on human trafficking in its broader context and intersections with gender migration, labor and development. Uh, the journal publishes uh, two issues per year uh, in April and September. Each issue has a guest editor who is an academic um, and is specialized in the field, and each issue is devoted to a specific predetermined theme that we have identified as uh, current or under-researched. So very briefly, the, the two issues which we will publish next year um, will be on the theme of traffickers. This will be the issue in April next year. And in September next year, the issue will be on the theme of uh, uh, migration, sexuality, and gender identity. And we are still uh, accepting uh, paper submissions for this uh, issue. So if you are interested, look through the website. You can find all the previous issues um, and uh, information about more information about the journal. The aim of today's meeting is to highlight the last issue uh, that we published, which was on the topic of anti-trafficking education with guest editors Annie Fukushima, Annie Hill, and Jennifer Sachfant. So uh, with this introduction, I will uh, go on to introduce um, our participants, uh, the speakers at tonight's event. These are Annie Isabel Fukushima, Associate Professor in Ethnic Studies with the School for Cultural and Social Transformation at the University of Utah in the United States. Annie Hill, Associate Professor in the Department of Rhetoric and Writing and an affiliate with the Center for Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Texas in Austin in the United States. Vandana Patanaik, International Coordinator of the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women in Thailand. Jennifer Sachwand, an associate professor at Ohio State University, who is jointly appointed in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies in the Department of Slavic and East European Languages and Cultures. Um, Mariah Grant, um, director of research and advocacy at the Sex Workers Project of the Urban Justice Center in the United States. And Nalini Nayak, General Secretary of the, of the Self-Employed Women's Association in India. So with that, I pass on over to Annie Hill, who will be facilitating the discussion. Over to you, Annie. Thank you, Bobby. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, so this special issue um, is titled Anti-Trafficking Education. And um, all of us who are editors and contributors um, to this special issue have been engaged in education in various ways, but from different locations and with different audiences and goals. Uh, so to begin this conversation, we wanted to reflect just on the concept of education, just to ground the conversation, the concept of education, how education is understood and how it's used in various contexts. Um, so I'd like to invite Bandana to start off with thinking about um, how has education been conceptualized uh, in your experience? Okay, thank you, Annie, and uh, hello, everybody. Before I go on to um, uh, respond to your question, I would actually like to congratulate uh, three of you, the, our wonderful guest editors, and of course, our in-house editor, Bobby. So this is, uh, at the moment, I have only read the one, uh, very good introduction and waiting for the uh, hard copy to arrive so that I can read the articles. So um, to go on to your question, Annie, uh, um, let me, so how has GATW gone about anti-trafficking education? I came to GATW Secretariat from academia and I was very interested in processes of learning and unlearning and pedagogy. 
I was also very interested in questions of whose knowledge counts and why. So uh, when I came to get W, obviously the questions, I mean, the things that I wanted to understand was how does get W build its thematic knowledge? How does it learn? How does it share those learnings with whom and for what purpose? And like the classroom teacher that I was, I also wanted to know what prior knowledge does get W assume in people before sharing its own learnings and knowledge. And finally, I also wanted to know if there was a self-reflective process that enables get W to build new knowledge. So talking to founding members, member organizations, and observing our workshops, and later doing some myself, I was able to understand the process a little bit. And uh, what I understood is the primary goal of KW was to develop a human rights approach to trafficking in persons in the practices of state and non-state actors and in law. In terms of knowledge building, what I have understood is our process have always included reading and textual analysis using the human rights lens. Uh, unlike now, when we began, there were not many texts available uh, you know, in the late 80s and early 90s. But legal texts, for example, which mentioned trafficking, trafficking in women, those days it was exclusively referred to as trafficking in women. And uh, then anti-trafficking laws of various countries and UN instruments. Another part of textual knowledge building was learning about human rights, the human rights framework, how it can be applied to anti-trafficking, and more specifically, how it can be used to protect the rights of trafficked persons. Uh, learning about the UN architecture, for example. And one centerpiece of that knowledge building or learning was listening to lived experiences of people, particularly women, who were seen as trafficked and women who were rejecting that label. For example, the sex workers and analyzing if there was any discrepancy between self-representation and representation by others. In terms of knowledge sharing, uh, you know, how we went about sharing the knowledge and learnings is through conceptual clarity workshops, advocacy planning and debrief workshops, primarily for uh, NGOs, primarily for the Alliance members and partners, but sometimes also for government officials and law enforcement. The other way that we have shared what we have learned is through publications. Some of the early publications, for example, Human Rights Standards for Treatment of Trafficked Persons, uh, Moving the Whole Stigma, Human Rights in Practice, How to Assist Trafficked Women and Children, etc. And the purpose was to enable the Alliance members to do their work well, and to take collective action. For example, lobbying with the governments for specific actions or specific legislation or implementation of legislation. Uh, about the assumed knowledge, the knowledge that KW assumed the audience has was, it was assumed that CSOs are integrally connected to social justice movements and that their politics is left of center and people centered. So solid prior social analysis was taken for granted. And many academics and activists have supported GetW in these education processes. If I were to name just two people, uh, Ali Miller, for example, and the late Sunila Vesekara uh, from Sri Lanka. And finally, you know, building new knowledge I do think we have always had a sort of process of a self-reflective process. And we have used feminist participatory action researches uh, to uh, understand things, uh, you know, explore and understand systematically uh, on the basis of or from the lived experiences of people. And the last, uh, uh, way in which uh, we also build new knowledge is by comparing experiences and practices from different regions, people's understandings, etc. So I think these are some of the things that we have uh, done. I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Does anybody want to add anything to that? 
could I come in there, um, um, Annie? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, well, I I come from another background and my location, as I would say, which has been with women workers per se, because I work in a trade union of informal workers, and um, the, um, entering the field of trafficking actually starts for us from the aspect of migration as people move from areas um, of deprived or you know for various reasons and search for work elsewhere and i would like to share here in this first part of the webinar uh, our work with interstate migration because you know india is a very large country and uh, people migrate from one region to another within the same country but regions can be very different and uh, uh, trafficking takes place even within the country. But in this process, um, as we would say, we would, when we interact with women, our first um, understanding of education is how we raise awareness, starting from the lived experiences, why people migrate, um, why are you moving? So how people understand the reasons for why they are going, which of course then relates them to the political um, situation in the country itself. I mean, as you prod into the questions um, with them, one gets a picture of the problem and people migrate for various reasons. It could be poverty, it could be distress because of climate, it could be um, violence between communities, co communal violence. So for various reasons, people begin to move. And, and then how in this process, when they move, what uh, leads them to go into certain locations, to other locations? And there, so this would be the first part of the understanding. The second is, in this process, do you understand that you are a worker? Who are you when you move? Because everybody moves for work. So as a worker, do you understand that you are a worker? And that as a worker, you have rights. And as a worker, you have, you're protected in this process of migration. Why? Because migration within your country is a right. You can move. You don't have to be secretive about it. You don't have to be cheated because of it. And in this process, we try to help uh, bring this awareness to the workers about what their rights are as workers. And depending on the, the time we have with the group, you know, we would and the kind of work they want to do when they migrate, then we would bring information about that particular sector of work. For instance, I've been working a lot with the domestic workers who migrate. And so what is, what is your right as a domestic worker? What do you know about the Domestic Workers Convention? What are the protections domestic workers have in our country or don't have? And all the issues about harassment at the workplace. And in this process, uh, what is, um, uh, what is uh, your uh, forced labor? Like when you go, how much do you know about what you're going to find at the other end? Who is taking you? What do you ask the person who's taking you? And in this process, we arrive at the problems they may have on the journey. And, and then in this process, what do you do if you face a problem? So we would come to, um, when you face problems, what do you do? So the information about your helplines and uh, the other kinds of, possibilities you would have. And the best way, of course, would be if you organize, you belong to some organization of workers whom you can fall back on, who support you in your place of origin and also in your destination. So this is the process of awareness raising and organizing that we would link together in talking about migration and what happens um, in this process in case uh, you are trafficked. So we arrive at trafficking as um, one, one part of the process of migration, but basically you know, we would speak about um, their rights as well. Uh, migration is a right and the legal protections you can have and then uh, belonging to a union as your uh, basic protection in the process. 
I'll stop with that for now. Thank you. Um, so in listening to both of your responses, I'm noticing that both Bandana and Nalini really underscored one conceptual clarity, which I think we all know we're still wrestling with a lot in the arena of anti-trafficking, certainly also anti-trafficking education. What are the concepts we're using? What do we mean by trafficking? Who are we talking about? Who are we talking to? Um, and then also the kind of structural or social analysis um, that should ground these efforts. And so both of you spoke about this is kind of where you started from. Um, and in the special issue, we um, really looked at future directions, looking at anti-trafficking education, it's not being particularly grounded, right? And sometimes not even thinking about the structural. And so um, I'd like to pitch the next question to Jenny, um, one of the co-editors, um, and ask you, Jenny, what are some of the future directions that might connect anti-trafficking education with labor and liberation movements? And we talked a lot about labor and understanding oneself as a worker, um, but we do see a kind of disconnect between anti-trafficking education um, and labor and liberation movements. So we were kind of thinking, what are the future directions to bring these things together in education. Thanks to my, my colleagues and collaborators, co-conspirators on this project and here on this webinar. Uh, I've just um, been listening to Nalini and um, Bandana and really what struck me is the emphasis on starting from lived experiences and then moving from there. And so I, you know, and when working on this special issue, I think one of the things that really has stuck out to me is that I think that, you know, anti-trafficking as a, um, you know, as a, as, a, as a concern at the governmental and non-governmental level, uh, you know, obviously has grown immensely uh, since the 2000s. Uh, but I think that there's been an emphasis on like the law, like what is human trafficking and not necessarily starting from the plurality of lived experiences. And so, uh, you know, anti-trafficking education, whether it's um, outreach in the classroom or part of governmental and not, or non-governmental public awareness campaigns, I think needs to be um, in terms of like future directions, it needs to be dislodged from a kind of narrow legalistic focus on human trafficking as an aberration in global capitalism to an understanding of human trafficking as part of, I guess, a spectrum of possible labor exploitation. So human trafficking is treated, I think, too much in isolation rather than part of a larger context of, of labor exploitation. I, I hear that echoed in Nalini and Bandana's um, comments as well. So in this broader context, anti-trafficking education, I think should be situated and related to longstanding mobilizations for workers and human rights, including unions, worker collectives. Uh, in the US, for example, the Coalition for Immokalee Workers uh, or the International Ladies Garment Workers Union um, wage theft campaigns, uh, sex worker rights organizations such as like La Strada International uh, or Butterfly in Canada uh, or the Sex Worker Project um, in New York. Um, um, and also migrant rights organizations, right? So, uh, so in addition to sort of putting human trafficking and anti-trafficking education within this broader context, I think uh, equally as important in terms of future directions is to have a very honest and critical assessment of the collateral damage that the, the, the current emphasis on the legalistic focus has created. And I think one thing that comes strongly out from the special issue is that you know, human trafficking education and its proliferation in terms of new sites has really um, allow for uh, the creep of a carceral approach to human rights. So that means that access to human rights is through a police officer, access to um, uh, you know, re resources like you know, um, immigration resources and things like this um, are through police or courts. And so anytime you attach police, border control, courts to human rights, that means that there's an amplification uh, and hypercriminalization of those who are already surveilled, criminalized, 
and regulated at the border, um, you know, in certain um, industries and what have you. So I think sort of prosecuting human trafficking has been the driving logic of anti-trafficking and anti-trafficking education. And as a result, anti-trafficking is often in the service of policing, border control, detention centers, criminalization and hypercriminalization. And I realize that we still want to be able to hold on to some of this legal part, right? It obviously matters a great deal, but as you know, Lenini was saying, lots of folks don't identify as drift trafficking victims. And in fact, my, their human rights might be best served um, through other lenses and other um, apparatus uh, than an anti-trafficking or a, a, a narrow understanding of, of anti-trafficking. Uh, so those are just a few thoughts building on what folks have said and look forward to hearing more what others have to say about that too. Yeah, thank you. I wanna um, just pause for a second if anybody wanted to add to um, what Jenny has said about thinking about anti-trafficking education and its connection or disconnection with labor and liberation movements and what um, possibilities are there for creating more alliances, more coalition, um, what we're calling future direction. So did anybody want to um, chime in there? I just want to open that space. Yeah, I would add to that that at the Sex Workers Project of the Urban Justice Center, uh, we're a national organization and we work with folks who are involved in the sex trades. We also work with people who have experienced trafficking in the sex trades. And so a lot of our work is not just on prevention of trafficking, that is a big part of it, but also working with folks who have experienced harm from anti-trafficking efforts. And speaking to what Jennifer was saying around how we're doing training, how that's fitting within expansion of carceral approaches, one of the concerns we have is around training that's happening in other industries. So in the ATR, it discussed training for medical providers, training for perhaps social workers, teachers, people who may interact with somebody who's experiencing trafficking. And what we see with people who are doing sex work is that they may be identified as somebody who is experiencing trafficking when they themselves would not identify as such. One of the concerns we have is around the kind of training, the kind of education that service providers may receive where they are emboldened to identify people or feeling like that is now part of their job previously you know, being a doctor, being a nurse, that was their main criteria was to provide medical care. And now they're also assessing people for risk factors of having been trafficked. And their education may be coming from the Blue Campaign, which is run by the Department of Homeland Security in the United States, or from the Department of Health and Human Services, which is another agency in the United States government that may not provide the nuance necessary to understand the potential harms in identifying somebody as having been trafficked, whether that be they don't have immigration status and by being identified, the person who is the service provider may trigger a series of events where law enforcement gets involved. Somebody may face deportation, may experience other harms. So training needs to be thoughtful around what happens when anti-trafficking efforts are deployed, not just identify someone, yay, we've rescued them, but what are the consequences of anti-trafficking? So I just wanted to add that point. Excellent. Um, I also, I think the echo <laughs> emphasized certain points, so that was good. Um, I want to kind of build on this because I think, um, Jenny, you really pointed out how one of the things that's happened is trafficking has become isolated or detached as kind of its own object of study or object of analysis. Um, and so one of the things that um, I think as we worked for conceptual clarity around, you know, what is trafficking and why is it seen as an anomaly or separate? Um, this brings me to the question we had um, thought about earlier. I want to pitch this to um, the other Annie, Annie um, Isabel Fukushima. With thinking about what are the frameworks that we use um, to teach about trafficking, to understand trafficking, um, because I think, Mariah, what you were talking about, there's obviously like a carceral frame that predominates in the United States, right, a legalistic frame. So what other frameworks are available um, for us to, to talk about, to teach about, to think about, to learn about um, this thing that we keep calling trafficking? Thank you. Um, and thank you all for your lovely reflections. I think this is kind of what we were hoping uh, would be an extension of the special issue is a wider conversation about um, education and awareness, because it, when we came together and we 
organize the call, one of the things that I think we had and we're recognizing is that there are multiple tensions that are occurring uh, regarding human trafficking education or the education about human trafficking as a subject. Um, and one of the things that we know, though, is that like when, when I think uh, with Freddy, Paulo Freddy, is that, you know, education can be both um, a site of liberation. It can also be a site of oppression. Um, and so one of the things that I think um, in the frameworks that we are hoping that folks will think alongside or sideways. There are frameworks of intersectionality that come up in the special issue. There are frameworks around human rights um, that percolate as well. There are also frameworks, I think, when uh, we see of anti-oppressive practice um, coming up in the special issue, um, as well as um, the framework of thinking around issues of um, you know, racism, um, heterosexism, and a range of isms that shape our society. And these were the things that we were really wanting to see uh, more of and we're super excited to receive and learn with um, as special issue editors is that there are a range of ways that people are talking about issues when uh, abuse, violence, um, or exploitation occurs in our communities and how they're going about organizing, um, coordinating together um, to learn, to self-reflect. And I think that's one of the things that I really appreciated also that Bandana brought up was this notion of the self-reflective. Um, and so we did see um, in our forum, some of the pieces actually grappling with that. Um, but there are a range of frameworks that have um, that are out there that I don't know. And that was one of the um, tensions that you'll see um, in the um, editorial that we were grappling with is that you know, we don't know if it's being applied in all aspects of the movement, these move towards complexity, um, that there is these moves actually in the United States in particular on um, my context, um, where we see that there is more of um, a neoliberal way of responding to human trafficking, whether it's number of participants trained to um, grant writing, um, and so not really seeing um, the radical possibilities that education and teaching and learning can offer in all of its complexities, that teaching and learning is happening in the everyday. It's happening in conversations. It is happening, um, yes, in institutions as well, but there's so many ways that it is happening that communities are altering and shifting and creating social change. Um, and so that's just to kind of reflect on those frameworks. And I think that one of the things though that we know is that um, in in our particular context, there is a danger to not having a self-reflective, critical, um, as well as a move towards a complex process around education. Um, you know, I was recently at um, a hearing um, with the um, U.S. Um, you know, with the U.S. Um, uh, Office of Victims of Crime. And it was around end demand strategies. Um, and again, it felt like we were returning back to older conversations that happened um, you know, in the early, in the 90s. Um, and so, you know, we see these conversations, but we also see how people are so, um, you know, there is affect, there is emotion um, that is tied to how they're responding to these issues. And so one of the special issues here um, in, uh, in the contributions, um, they talk about QAnon. Um, and so we can see that even, um, it, at the, you know, there's just a whole range in which if we don't critically grapple with um, how we're learning about human trafficking, there is criminalization, carcerality, yes, but then there's also where we start having even people participate um, in vigilante, um, you know, actions where they themselves are becoming citizen police. Um, and so I do think that there needs to be um, a a move as um, Jenny was appealing for towards these complexities, towards having conversations that actually really interrogates um, how have uh, we really um, enacted a practice of human rights in the United States? And what we see is that, um, you know, my colleague and I had done a, um, a survey of different organizations in the US that were federally funded. And we found that most of them are not enacting a human rights practice. Um, and so that's just to pause there um, and uh, to the response to that question. Thank you so much. That covered a lot of ground. Um, I'd like to also just open space um, now also to the other panelists, if you wanted to comment, thinking about alternative frameworks um, for teaching about, for learning about um, 
trafficking, because I do think we are seeing, and it, it varies by sites, then it might be important to think about sites. Annie mentioned the United States. Um, and so we definitely have a legalistic carceral <laughs> demand slash 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 framework here. But I'm wondering if people want to contribute to other things that they've seen and other frameworks that might be um, useful, because we did see the kind of contribution that we got really are kind of mapping this field of what's becoming predominant in the way to talk about and teach about trafficking. I've worked in other frameworks, uh, having worked overseas for a long time. I actually worked with GATW as a consultant many years ago um, and have been educated on the human rights framework, as Bandana was speaking to earlier, understanding the UN systems that exist, the mechanisms for advocacy that are available through international protocols. Um, but I also wanted to ground some of what Annie had said in terms of in the US context, which I know we've spoken at length about, but why in the US we tend towards a focus on civil rights versus human rights and that there's a large racist underpinning of that uh, in the early 1900s that focused on civil rights versus human rights because within the context of international diplomacy, it was hard for the US government to really genuinely focus on human rights domestically when there was broad sweeping uh, rights violations happening against the black community in the country. And that we also see that being integrated into the way that anti-trafficking legislation has been developed within the US context as well, that we start, you know, I don't have to go back and do the whole education and history of the legal system in the United States, but we see that racism plays a huge role. And then I also consider the role that the United States has played in exporting the way that we identify trafficking and the way that we fund anti-trafficking efforts globally so that what we do here has an impact beyond the borders of this country in terms of anti-trafficking and focusing on this carceral approach. So it has a much broader um, impact. I would also be really interested to hear from other folks who've worked more in a labor rights, worker rights framework. Um, I see that as something that's going to be critical as we move towards hopefully decriminalization legislation in the United States, that we don't just decriminalize sex work and then not have ideas around how the industry is going to then operate. Because I think that what we would end up with is something similar to how cannabis has been decriminalized in different states in this country and then has been taken over by a few powerful individuals who have then really monetized the sale of cannabis and have become individually wealthy, but it isn't benefiting the industry as a whole. So we don't want to move towards decriminalization of the sex trades and then have it be just like any other industry in the U.S. where the most marginalized within the workforce are further being harmed. I mean, I think the history is helpful as well. And um, Bandana, you also offered a history um, and really thinking about how you organize and mobilize around trafficking. I think one thing the editorial really tried to point out that um, the default position of seeing education as a good, just a good thing, uh, without recognizing that it's also something that can be oppressive, right? That can be uh, misleading, that can uh, circulate myths that can focus on some people versus others. And I'm thinking about your kind of comment about the US history around um, whether we can talk about human rights. I'm in Texas, and so we just had this, um, I'm sure you've seen it, um, had Texas Rangers with horses and whips um, driving uh, Haitian refugees um, into the Rio Grande River. And so the history is very much alive. Uh, and so I'd like to, the next question is something that we found um, is actually a really vexed question. And one of um, the things we saw in the contributions was how do you um, center the people who are most impacted by trafficking and anti-trafficking efforts? Right? How do you center them um, in education without just kind of extracting their, their stories and circulating them? Um, and so I'll start with Mariah, but I'd like to invite um, all the panelists to, to reflect and answer that question. Um, so kind of continuing on with what I had been discussing um, and just contextualizing what the Sex Workers Project of the Urban Justice Center does. So we're a nonprofit law firm. We provide services to people who have been involved in the sex trades, whether that be by choice, circumstance, or coercion. Um, so that includes people who have been trafficked. We provide um, services nationally throughout the US. 
We also do research and uh, policy advocacy, which is the work that I oversee. And we have a communications director who oversees a lot of our education programs. So uh, part of how we ensure that the work that we're doing centers the experiences of people impacted by trafficking and anti-trafficking efforts is to have a staff who reflects the communities that we work with. So we have people with lived experience of having done sex work either currently or in the past. We also partner with organizations that are majority or fully led by people who have been trafficked or have done sex work. Um, so we partner a lot with Red Canary Song, which was mentioned, or I don't, I think um, actually an organization, Butterfly was mentioned, but um, Red Canary Song, similar to Butterfly, works with uh, majority Asian migrant sex workers. Um, in the US, we work with this organization to assess what's happening within massage businesses, um, sites where there's labor happening. Um, it might be sexual services as well. So it intersects with the work that we're doing broadly. Um, uh, the Black Sex Work Collective, BIPOC Adult Industry Collective, all organizations that rely on the knowledge and expertise of people with that lived experience. And then in terms of not wanting to be extracted, which is the goal of any of the education that we're doing, making sure that the research that we do, and this was something that Bendana was speaking to earlier as well, is producing something that is tangible afterwards. So how do we do research that then is useful to the community that it's meant to be in service of? So right now we've started a research project with the Global Health Justice Partnership um, and who Bandana had uh, mentioned earlier, Ali Miller, uh, who is a co-director of GHJP. We're developing a, a non-prosecution among district attorney um, a toolkit related to non-prosecution for uh, charges related to sex work. Um, so developing research, but then also making sure that this toolkit is something that can be used by organizations on the ground to do advocacy with their local jurisdiction, with their local non uh, district attorney. Uh, so it's making sure that our research is not just about developing a report that is then very lengthy and might have a lot of language that is really only understood within an academic context, but making sure that perhaps we do do a research report, but then we also create individual smaller pieces of media. Um, we've also recently uh, produced a film. It's part of a docu-series that we've developed. Um, so it's called Sexual Healing. We released it in September on September 16th in New York City, and we're going to be um, showing it at a number of other venues. But this is directly developed by our communications director who has lived experience doing sex work. Um, a lot of the folks that were involved in developing the film itself have experience and everybody who is profiled in the film have experience doing sex work on kind of a range of experiences within the sex trades. And that is critical for any of the educational materials that we develop, that it centers the experiences of those people who are most going to be impacted. For us, the people who are impacted by anti-trafficking measures tend to be sex workers. We also frame the work that we're doing with the broader, within the broader worker rights movement in the United States, as I spoke to earlier, because yes, we work on decriminalization legislation, but we also wanna to think towards the future. What does it look like once we've achieved that goal? What does working in the industry look like once it is decriminalized more broadly? Um, and within that, we also look to people who are working within legalized or regulated sex trades in the US. So that might be stripping or porn to kind of guide us in what are the pitfalls that we're going to see and what do we want to avoid? Um, so I think that I can kind of leave it there because I'm really interested to hear what other presenters have to say on this front. But uh, I would just say that really genuinely making sure that people who are going to be most impacted are leading um, and then also looking to educational materials that have already been produced by folks with that lived experience. And I can share a resource with that as well. What we have been uh, doing uh, is um, shifting the question a little bit from asking our colleagues, what do you work on? From that to who do you work with? Who are the people you work with? And then, you know, it's somehow sort of, you know, links this thing, what work those people do? Do they see themselves as workers? And that's the kind of uh, thing. So that's in our 
own little way, we try to shift the discourse from, okay, we work on trafficking, forget about the thing, who do you work with? Do you work with people who have been trafficked or do you work with uh, domestic workers? Do you work with sex workers? Do you work with, you know, who are the people you work with? What work they do? And what are their experiences at those workplaces? So that's one thing. The other thing that we do is bringing different groups of workers together and, uh, and including the traffic survivors in that conversation as well. So that, because we recognize that not everyone who has had what can be legally uh, seen as a trafficking experience has been identified. There are some people who don't want to identify themselves. Uh, there are people who are not identified by the system. So we bring in uh, workers in low wage jobs, in precarious work, as well as those who have been trafficked, you know, have been identified. And those conversations, if it is done sensitively, if it is done well, it actually yields very, very, and, you know, powerful result. The solidarity among workers is stronger. And I think uh, the people who support them, the advocates or the assistance providers also tend to learn a lot. So I think these are some of the things that uh, we do. Uh, yeah, maybe I can come in uh, to follow from what Bandana uh, spoke, uh, because uh, working with the agency of the workers themselves, the survivors who have been exploited in their migration journeys. And I think um, maybe I like to share an experience with you. And this has to do with uh, cross-border migration, uh, workers who go from India to the Gulf countries and things like that. And how we tried uh, to help the workers to speak to the state administrators, because uh, the state administrators also need to be educated because they don't understand the real issues of the vulnerable groups who migrate. Uh, because you have people who migrate easily because they are at the upper stratas, but it's with the workers who have the major problems. And among the, the administrators who come from different departments, they work in their own silos. While as this whole issue calls for an integration and understanding between the various departments. And so uh, we organized a public hearing um, with, the, uh, with the victims who spoke about their life stories. And we had sitting in the jury, uh, the Department of Labor, the crime branch, the immigration officers, the women's commission. And we had the, um, the agency, the government agency that um, registers workers for migration because these agencies don't register vulnerable workers. So if the process of migration is transparent uh, and workers can begin to understand it, then we can get out of the whole trafficking mess. But the point is that this is a political issue also. And it's the job of the workers to say, no, we want a transparent process. If this is our right, then how do we, how do we use this? In the within the machinery itself, so that we are not trafficked. And I think the public hearing, getting all these groups together, actually led, at least for us in South India, it led to a much better collaboration between departments and assisted workers in their migration process, uh, so that workers now know to whom they can go when an agent, a, a, a labor agent comes to them and says, we can take you for a job somewhere. So we've opened those channels through this process and the workers begin to know now gradually how they can probably go safe uh, without getting in, entangled into all these trafficking uh, networks. So I think as an organization, these, institutions also be, have to be educated because they also have to work in a more integrated manner to make the whole process of labor migration more transparent. Thank you so much. Um, 
before we jump to the Q&A where we're going to invite um, the audience to raise their hand or put questions um, in the chat, I just wanted to, um, on this final question, uh, pitch it to Annie and Jenny if they have final remarks. Yeah, um, I just love where this conversation is going around um, labor rights um, and all of this. I think it's just so important. Um, I think that the uh, reality is, is that we all labor. We all participate in some form of labor, whether it's paid or unpaid. Um, but what we're hearing um, and learning about through the different opportunities to be educated is that some people's labor um, it counts for more capital, whereas others don't. Um, and that in its, um, you know, in some conditions, what we see in, you know, places like the United States is like agriculture workers can work for long hours, stoop for long hours, um, and not actually have access to food, financial security, or housing security uh, without folks actually blinking an eye. Uh, we see that even happening to hotel workers. And what we saw in um, the COVID-19 uh, global pandemic pandemic is that there were um, essential workers that were essential to our society, but not essential enough to have um, the right to have the same rights. Um, and so we see um, even in our um, own context right now that I think these conversations around labor um, and who's seen um, is really important to think together and, and move together. And I think that, you know, um, you know, and even I think about like, for example, like um, that there are hierarchies around who is seen, and this came in some of the special issues too. some, I mean, the contributions, where there is also um, a duality that continues to persist, um, that in order to have access to rights, you have to have an access to a kind of victimhood. Um, otherwise, um, you know, there's criminalization. And we see this even with young folks who are forced to sell drugs, uh, forced to smuggle people um, that or participate in other other informalized ways um, because of a range of complexities in their lives. Um, but those youth continue to be criminalized in the United States as well, as well as adults too. And so I think that one of the hopes that I think as you all, um, you know, as an audience connect with this special issue is that um, you see the, the goal, which is um, a commitment to interrogate what it means to educate about human trafficking, what it means to be educated about human trafficking, because if we uh, we have to um, continue to make more complicated our practices, and I think a lot of the contributions provide a specific way to think about a practice um, that you can then pull and think with. Um, and so I just so appreciated the public hearing example that Nalini offered, because that really, to me, um, gets at, um, I'm really thinking a lot about witnessing the actions that we're called to. Um, and that I think that many of, um, you know, folks in the United States um, don't interrogate those actions. And so that is what I think that this is an appeal for in the educational context, whether it is everyday workshops to participation in court hearings, to um, teaching in the classroom, wherever you're um, seeing teaching happening and you're participating in it, that, you, that we all continue um, all together um, to interrogate those practices. Thank you, Annie. Jenny, did you wanna to add to that? Uh, maybe just super, super briefly, but I think with the question being, you know, how do we center the people, uh, people's experience, lived experiences the most impacted? And I just want to also suggest another conceptual shift that, um, you know, as anti-trafficking has, um, see, I think uh, education and, and outreach has um, increased its incorporation of survivor stories. Um, and, and there's the you know, proliferation of survivor-led anti-trafficking organizations as well. I think um, sort of the, the potential there is for, again, the sort of increased focus on, on risk factors and that, and that, and in fact, that, like people are not the problem in, in trafficking and labor exploitation. Systems of oppression are the problem. And so the, the risk of centering I think, um, or the, the, repair, the repair that we assume is happening with the inclusion of survivor stories may be limited if the outcome, the impact isn't actually reparative or having an impact on systems of oppression, whether or not that's um, the experiences of, um, uh, of trafficking and um, gender violence with indigenous um, women and girls in Canada and the United States, or whether or not it's uh, the super exploitation of, of, of migrants 
and refugees who are, you know, languishing in detention centers or um, refugee, um, you know, temporary camps, um, and then finding informal labor because in order to be a refugee, you often can't work legally, uh, right? So if we're not actually addressing the oppressive systems, then I think the risk factors around individuals can, again, like hyper-focus on um, the problematic aspects of, of anti-trafficking so far. Thanks for letting me add that. Wait, can I just add really quickly, one of the pieces, um, the submissions or contributions um, talks about equitable partnership. And so I just wanted to put that language out there. It's like, what would that really look like uh, for us to think about equitable partnerships transnationally, locally, um, in all the work that we're doing? What would that really look like to partner uh, with survivors and communities in an equitable way? Thank you all so much, um, especially the kind of end point of really questioning and interrogating um, our practices, those of us who are deemed experts, uh, really questioning who has expertise and who can claim that, and also the kind of pattern of looking at individual um, solutions to systemic structural problems. At this point, I'm going to turn it over um, back to Bobby, and we invite your questions. Feel free to raise your hand virtually in the chat um, or put a question or comment into, um, into the chat or raise your hand. Um, so that we can call on you and see your reflections and questions for um, what people have shared. Thank you so much. I just want to shout out that we see some of our contributors here. So um, we see Bon Benton, Danielle Peterka Benton, um, and I'm just going to make sure I don't miss anybody else. Did I miss anybody else? I think those two folks, I just want to appreciate you both for joining us. Thank you. Yes, actually, I, I was chatting with Bond and Danny before that. And um, yeah, so since anyway, we don't have any questions, I would like to invite Bond and Danny to, um, if they want, they can, you can say something about uh, a bit about your article, or if you want, you can uh, reflect on the things that the other speakers were speaking about. Yeah, I, I will go ahead and, and just start, and, and I want to preface this by saying that um, I have no research background in uh, uh, the anti-trafficking movement. Um, I rely on the expertise of the, the wonderful folks like the folks on the panel and uh, um, all of the researchers and survivors who have contributed to the discourse surrounding the issue. I rely on that as my window. Um, my background is communication, particularly professional applied communication. Um, as it relates to social media, like social media is my big kind of like research area. And uh, the theme of the article that we did um, was on the QAnon phenomenon. I think most people here are probably familiar with the QAnon phenomenon. Um, essentially, it is a, an online conspiracy that there is an elite cobble of people who are um, uh, abducting and trafficking um, and sexually abusing and harvesting the organs of children in large numbers. It is a patently absurd sounding theory, except for the fact that it has gained a great deal of traction. And for many people has become synonymous with human trafficking, right? Like this is what's, what's happened. Um, um, our article kind of looks at how this uh, uh, story became prevalent in social media. And I think that, that if I just had to sort of say one thing, I don't wanna take away everybody's time here. Um, I think that it is concerning that the discourse surrounding trafficking has been hijacked by a conspiracy like this. Um, but I think the panelists here today brought up an, a, a wonderful point, which is what about the discourse of human trafficking as it's constructed now, what makes it so co-optable, right? I think that that is one of those questions. So long as we root um, trafficking in terms of uh, um, like, like gender, race, and class, so long as sensational stories are put to the front, so long as certain anti-trafficking organizations um, uh, use kind of spurious statistics to make it look like an omnipresent menace on every playground in America, um, I think that we can expect more conspiracies like this um, because um, uh, uh, reasoned uh, sort of discourse where we talk about systemic issues associated with trafficking in, a, in an authentic way is the only remedy to this. Um, and right now, the sensational um, is making the discourse of trafficking, unfortunately, more co-optable. And I think it's something that we have to address with education. First of all, like, great contribution from everybody here. It was super interesting to, to listen to you all. Um, I, think, I think we also need to be careful to, to just look at QAnon as this, as this weird little pocket that really only the most sort of um, 
extreme individuals would follow. It really has 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 given it like like large scale traction, and and you see it, uh, you know, in Facebook communities when moms share information about a weird car in the playground and the trafficking that happens and. Um, you know, you see it might maybe with donors for certain programs, you know, all of a sudden are motivated by this narrative, even though they're not QAnon adherents or something per se, but it's it just, it just flooded everything where, where these narratives are kind of pushed forward. Um, and, and I think that's, that's something, I think we can't just push the society as, as something that pertains to a small group, but it is really driving a larger, the larger discourse. Um, I was I was so happy to actually hear so many of you speak about um, labor exploitation, and um, for those of you in the United States, you know this is like it's like the stepchild. Yeah, nobody really talks much about labor exploitation, um, and particularly when you go, uh, you know, and talk to law enforcement, you know that that is often an area that is really sort of almost untouched. Um, um, like I'm, I'm, I'm working on a grant with the state of New Jersey right now, uh, actually on a like how data is compiled on human trafficking, yeah, um, and it's 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 really it's really sad to see how how labor trafficking isn't even a thing, um, and it's not that they don't care, but it's it's even for law enforcement it's hard to understand, hard to identify, you know, it's hard for to connect with the people that are affected um, because of language barriers uh, or whatever. So I, I think. Um, you know, there is a real, I don't know, it seems out of whack in terms of what we know of human trafficking, what people think they know about human trafficking. And so it's really, really important that we, we keep this in mind as we, no matter what level we are on or where we are at, how we kind of get this message out, but to also be mindful that there is a lot of misinformation already out there. Uh, and that is, that is something, a big thing to tackle, I think. Uh, thank you so much, <clears throat> Bond and Danny. Um, does anyone want to, uh, from the uh, panelists, want to address the question posed in the chat by Sarah Kavok, um, which is how can we shift the, the paradigm um, on, for teaching on trafficking towards a labor rights framework? Yeah, um, I would love to try to tackle that. I offered um, two of the articles from the special issue that I encourage you to check out that I uh, focus on actual class, you know, curriculum, as well as uh, another one uh, focuses on anti-oppressive practice in the field of social work. I think that one of the um, challenges um, is that uh, when we look at where um, it's being taught, we do see a lot of fields of social work, criminology um, in the United States um, taking up up uh, human trafficking education, uh, but there's some really cool programming that's happening in gender and feminist studies um, and, um, you know, in other kind of programming, I think, in transnationally, internationally happening, uh, not in the United States that you might want to check out. Um, but that's just to um, say that there is programming, um, but, you know, it, you do have academic freedom. And so faculty can design their own courses. Um, and so then really it is the onerous is on the educator to be a much more self-reflective and much more deeper in the way that they're even contending with um, their own kind of programming. And I think that was one of the challenges that we saw too, even in our own submissions that a lot of them focused on sexual economies and trafficking into sexual economies. And so then it was um, you know, upon us to try to widen that scope a bit as much as we could um, and deepen the conversation a bit. Um, but I think it's an ongoing tension um, that has a lot to do with how the anti-trafficking movement has been so polarized. And you see that even showing up in um, the curriculum and how we continue to um, reinforce that polarization even in our own curriculum. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think that there is, um, but there's really great um, organizations. I think that at the um, organizational outside of academe, there's some really cool education going on. Um, you know, Freedom Network USA is doing some really awesome stuff on housing um, that I really encourage you to check out. And so um, it's out there, it's just on us. Um, and not to say that there's a monolithic way to do this. We have to continually keep moving towards a complexity in our own pedagogies and teaching and how we structure our curriculum and even deepen that. And even I go back and want to change my teaching on a regular basis. So I'm moving my students in different ways. So that would be my recommendation. Can I just follow up real quickly? I think that's um, really, really interesting kind of um, riffing on what um, 
Danny Paterka Benton said about um, kind of labor um, being like the stepchild and it's not talked about. I mean, this is site specific and it's, you know, talking about the United States. Um, but I actually think one of, one of the kind of questions is to ask like, what are we not teaching? Right. So why, if we're talking about trafficking in the classroom, right, there are already frames that you might have that are going to come out of sociology or criminology. So why not have a labor frame? And it might mean that you have to do kind of like the very kind of nuts and bolts basic education to your students, but they're not getting it there. And it kind of made me think about, you know, critical race theory and the way that's trying to be banned. There are certain things that um, uh, people don't want to in classrooms, so I would go near them, <laughs> right? And this is depends on your level of protection, but I found that students are really curious, and when they learn about stuff, they're like, how the heck did I never hear about this before? How do I not know about this history? And it's like, exactly, that's the live question. Um, so one of the things I would say is to be really experimental about using different frames to talk about this issue, and also loosen who you think are experts um, about trafficking or about labor, and really tap into organizations because this is long-standing social movements in the United States that still exist that are around. Um, there is just a divide, right, between them and academia, and that is by design. Uh, and so I think you can kind of, you know, um, build those bridges outside of academia, make more connections um, with the community that you're in wherever you are. So I just wanted to kind of um, just float that, really ask the question, like, why, why are certain things not taught? Um, and maybe I can contribute to uh, making that become something that my students know about. Maybe that's a political contribution I can make in the classroom. Yes, Danny. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to add quickly, um, I think it also goes beyond the classroom. Um, and so I think especially in, on, on colleges, you can, you, can, you can actually spread a lot of awareness through through larger meetings. So we actually uh, organized a, um, like a, like a full day event with the Macaulay workers. Um, and it was so great. It was really, really wonderful because it was such a different story. And like so many people came late and said, oh my gosh, I didn't know, I wasn't aware. Um, and so it, part, one part is the curriculum, but, but that is really also very underdeveloped in, in many colleges across the United States. Um, but then to at least kind of supplement with, with, as I say, other events, venues where you bring those people in, we had them, in, you know, go to classes and such. So I think there's there's so much you can do that is not just the classroom per se. And I would just add uh, to that something else is I I think that that um, uh, uh, media literacy um, should uh, not be decoupled from uh, like like human trafficking education, right? Like I think that. Um, uh, there are uh, evaluating evidence, right? Uh, deciding what I share in social media. Um, there are people that can have their advocacy um, really misplaced if they're not um, uh, kind of cognizant of what um, uh, I'm contributing to. So I think that, that bringing media literacy um, into anti-trafficking, the anti-trafficking movement um, is going to be crucial um, because um, there, are, there are folks that will um, take this into directions that, that I think that we don't want it to go into. Thank you, Bong. Uh, Mariah. Yeah, I would just add to that um, the Institute of Human Rights and Peace Studies, which is at Mahidon University, that's where I studied for part of my master's program. So looking to any curriculum that they have, um, also the University of Sydney, it was a dual degree program, so master's in human rights. So they've definitely got some literature um, curriculums that could be useful. I also wanted to know, I saw in the chat some dis discussions around people who have lived experience, people who are survivors of trafficking and how they can be better integrated into education systems, into trainings, um, how their expertise and, and experiences can be part of what we understand around trafficking. And I know that I've spoken a lot about the US and I wanna contextualize it beyond just the US Western frame, but part of the problem we see in the work that we do is the criminalization limits who can be part of those conversations in a safe way that doesn't expose them to further harm. So needing to think through how do we get those insights? How do we have people with that lived experience being teachers in a way that doesn't end up with them being potentially targeted by law enforcement? I don't necessarily have the answer to that because we still live within a system of criminalization and carceral approaches heavily in the United States. But the um, Annie 
uh, Fukushima was speaking to a conversation that we were both part of last week with uh, representatives from the federal government and uh, local organizers, people from different aspects of anti-trafficking work discussing uh, and demand kind of policies. And specifically, a lot of folks are speaking to the harms of end demand policies that can exist for people who've been trafficked and also people who've done sex work. But also within that, there was a conversation around who within the survivor community has a voice in those spaces and that it's frequently people who are opposed to decriminalization. And that is by intention within the US structure that there is a gag order basically integrated into legislation that says that people can't speak about or support what they call legalization. So in theory, you could interpret that to mean that you can speak about decriminalization, but it's still a tactic that silences a lot of people who have lived experience and who may support decriminalization of sex work, but feel that they are barred from actually discussing that. So then we have people who are the educators within the federal government system who have that lived experience, but don't represent the breadth of experiences within the survivor community. So I wanted to note that as well. Thank, thank you, Mariah. Um, so there are no more questions in the chat and no more raised hands and it's past 10 p.m. here in Bangkok. Um, so I want to thank everyone um, for this really exciting and rich conversation. Um, and yeah, um, basically to uh, invite you um, again to, to read the special issue if you haven't done so. Um, uh, browse through the past issues of the journal, consider contributing to future issues, and uh, huge thanks to, uh, to all the speakers uh, tonight and to everyone who attended the webinar, and have a great day, night, afternoon, and so on. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.